have come to depend So I will come boldly with arms open wide In faith like a little child I just want to worship you Shalom, shalom, and welcome, everyone. Let me pause the music. Oh, it's such a beautiful place <laughs> in James Block. He's a good friend of mine, you guys. <clears throat> That's a good part of his uh, his song there. It's 7 o'clock. Time to learn you the calendar. Hallelujah. There probably will be some more to come in. And that's okay. I'm on two computers because um, this new computer won't run the new programs that I want to run. So I'll be jumping on to another one to share some of the ISR and things like that. So welcome everyone to the first Coach Archer Hebrew calendar class. And so apparently the fact that you all are here, you are interested in the calendar. No worries. I see your video. Uh, see your chat there, um, Marty. Uh, we do have a chat here in Zoom. So if you want to communicate with me, you can just hit that. So we got 13 that showed up. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Let me pray real quick. Abba who is so thankful, Father, for this opportunity to teach what you have told me is the most important teaching, this side of salvation, which is the name and the calendar. And Father, I pray, I pray that you would bless this meeting, that you would anoint it, that you would bring revelation and understanding to your people and let them see your calendar, Father. In your mighty name, in the name of Yeshua, amen. All right, you guys. Um, you, you had told me this is the greatest teaching, this side of the cross, or in other words, this side of salvation. Um, there's no other um, teaching other than salvation that is greater, if that makes any sense. 
The reason for that is because Yahuwah has hidden his Shabbats. He has hidden them one of the most important days of his calendar, which is Shabbat. If you recall in the book of Acts, this is when the Holy Spirit is poured out upon them and they're speaking in tongues. Now, incidentally, this is the time that you would told me that when this happens again, we will be in one mind and one accord, just like they were in the upper room. If you recall, if you read that, it says they were in one mind and one accord. And that is when he poured out his spirit. That's going to happen again. Amazingly, that's going to happen again. And it's because we know when the day is that hidden day. It's a hidden day, you guys. It happens on a new moon day, which means the moon is hidden. Okay. So the very first lesson that I'm going to get, a, I'm going to poll everyone and kind of see where we are in the calendar. But the very first lesson we're going to we'll talk about is the moon, how we reckon the moon. There are three days that the count that the bible gives us as days new moon day the work day and shabbat is everybody follow so um just keep that in mind the moon determines the moedim in hebrew that means shabbat new moons and feast so every feast is going to have something to do with the moon and more than likely, it's going to be a full moon, unless it's Shavuot. Shavuot is a hidden day. It is the day that Aaron convinced the people to bow down to a cow. And the reason for this is because he was only familiar with Aphis when he came out of Egypt. And when they were in the desert, they needed a visual to reconcile what Yahuwah was. Does that make any sense? Yahuwah has no form. Even though he has a face, he has a back. They didn't know what he looked like. And so what does Aaron do? And I don't think he did this maliciously, you guys. And so it, you can find this in chapter 34 of Exodus. He convinced the people to build a cow out of all the gold that they could collect. And it's because of he, he's coming out of Egypt. And he has no concept of what Yahuwah looks like. But if you look at that chapter, he consecrates a fast, uh, excuse me, a feast unto Yahuwah in chapter 34. And they built this, this uh, cow. This is something he brought from Egypt. He was bringing Egypt into the worship. Okay. So when Moses comes down, what does he do? He immediately sees, well, first of all, Yahuwah tells him what's going on. And Moses comes down from the mountain. By the way, Moses went up the mountain eight times, eight different times. And when he comes down this particular time, when they are in be between uh, Elim and Sinai, they're in a place called Sin, ironically, right? They're, they're deep, neck deep in the Sin, and they're building this calf. And who comes down? And, uh, you know, they, they're deep in Sin and, and worshiping this cattle it's because they don't know what you looks like they need a visual of what you looks like and so that's why they do this it's not a malicious thing but you judges it i believe personally this is why he hid his uh his holy day all right somebody's telling me just give me a second you guys one more person is trying to come in and they're getting kicked out um I don't know what the tailor says. It keeps kicking her out. Anyway, uh, so so they, where was I? I was talking about a, a sin. Yes. So this is when um, Aaron is per, is uh, presenting to them the uh, the golden calf, right? And Moses comes down. He smashes the. The Ten Commandments, when he sees what they're doing, he has to go back up. He spends more than 80 days up on the mountain with Yahuwah. And he's getting the 
the ten the, the, the law, the complete law. Now, when they get to a lien, which is one month, we're going to read that. That is in Exodus 16. I should have had that pulled up already. Just give me a second. When they leave Egypt, it takes them one month to get what to what is called a lien. And a lien is just on the other side of the sea. Okay. So it is not uh, it is not um, anywhere but that. That's really critical in understanding this because you was giving us something by the month. So starting on the fifteenth day, which is a Shabbat, you, you guys. Every time, every time you see the the, the term fifteenth day of the month in in the scriptures anywhere, it is always a Shabbat. Okay, we need we need to see that. And the moon determines this. And I'm going to prove that to you in just a moment. So it takes him a month to get to a lean. And that's where he starts to, to give them the work day. Here you go. Someone else coming in. He gives them the work day, the new moon, and the Shabbat all in one week, you guys. Um, and before I go any further, let me just get a poll on where everyone is. I just kind of jumped in. I apologize for that, but I want to get a kind of a poll on where everyone is on the on the Shabbat. Um, I realize that people are in different places, more, uh, more understanding than others. Some are just starting. And let me just say this. I appreciate every single one of you, the fact that you are learning this calendar. Um, and I believe this is critical in the end times. Uh, Here's another one. Hallelujah. She found her way. Thank you, Father. This is critical in the end times. Because uh, if you expect the Holy Spirit to be poured about, out upon you, it's going to be because of the calendar, primarily. Also the name. Those two things that you're walking in the name and that you understand his calendar. He's revealed that to me. And not just me, to other people as well. I got a confirmation from someone down in Florida this past week on that very same thing that Yahuwah had told them that there is no prophet of Yahuwah that does not know the calendar and the name. I saw that with the election. Not one of them, you guys, 400 plus so-called prophets that were saying Donald Trump was going to be president. And Yahuwah says, I'm not going to lift one finger to stop this, this steal of the election. And this is what he was doing. He was revealing the fake ones and that whole thing. And not one of them knew the name. Not one of them are on the correct Shabbat. And so by default, he was, he was expressing they're not his. Okay. So he, he did that all in one swoop. Welcome, everybody. I see there, there's some there still coming in. Welcome, everybody. And still are coming in more. Thank you, Father. There's so many people hungry for the truth. So we're going to start with the moon tonight, you guys. Um, those of you just coming into the meeting, we're, we are just getting started. You literally are not missing anything. Uh, this is the absolute beginning of it. Okay, so don't, don't, uh, don't fret. And I'm also recording this, by the way, just in case. I don't intend on putting this on YouTube, but you never know when you're going to catch something remarkable. And so um, that's why I, I recorded this. So we're going to start with the moon. Psalm 104, 19 tells us that the moon determines the Moedim. That word in Hebrew means feast, new moons, and Shabbats. Okay, so we're going to start with the three days that the Bible describes. There are three particular days that the bible describes uh, and that's it one of those being a new moon day and this is the biggest reason why why those on the zadok calendar or the hillel calendar have to what do what's called intercalation it means they have to add days to the calendar you may have seen recently in the banter back and forth between myself and another YouTube channel, uh, and, and they like to post something from Jubilees about um, 
you know, the new, the, the new moon coming in or the moon coming in 10 days too soon in Jubilees, right? What we need to understand about that, it, and it talks about 10 days in particular, if you do not reconcile the new moons to the year, by the time you get to Abib, you have t- uh, roughly 10 days extra. It can be nine days. It can be 11 days. But if you do not count those new moon days, which can be a count of one or two, and this is why they end up with, with another extra days, because it's a lot of times it's, it's a two-day count, you end up with 10 days extra. Okay, so it throws the whole calendar off. The fact is, the Bible tells us, we, we can even see this in, in Genesis 1, that he created the sun, moon, and stars for what? For times, seasons, right? And we still got more coming in. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. You got a question, Marty. Let's go ahead and answer it. This is what I like about um, uh, Zoom. When I do a video, you guys can answer any. You can ask any questions. You're you're asking questions down in the uh, the description or down below the video. I don't always see that, but in Zoom, you can ask me directly. So go ahead, Marty. What's your question? Okay, thank you. My question is, um, I know you said there's a couple of days that we don't count uh, before the new moon, before the sighting of the new moon, or not new moon, but the silver crescent, I believe it is. Am I right. correct? That's correct. Okay, so have you ever counted those days that you don't count to see if it adds up to like 364? Yeah. You'll end up with more days than the calendar holds it's, if you do that. It, it is, it, what I've, I've always expressed to my students is that um, it's called uh, conjunction. It's a whole pattern, in other words. Okay, so let's, let's take, for instance, the seventh month with the Jews. You know what they do in the seventh month? It's Rosh Hashanah. There are two yeah. witnesses that go and sight the moon. And when they see the moon, they blow the shofar and it, they yeah. declare trumpets. Did you know that happens every month? Yes. Every month we're supposed to sight the new moon. At we're supposed beginning. to we're supposed to blow the trumpets, and there's a feast every month. It's called Rosh Hodesh. Yes, Jonathan, you told me that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's how I know that. <laughs> yeah. So it is like a it's it's a day between the two months. So you got the month the month prior and the month after. And you have a, a whole pattern, which could be one day or it could be two. Now, what there was a time, you guys, in history, and we know this from looking at all um, um, uh, cultures across the world, Chinese, Babylonian, Syrian, any, any of them, they all record a 360-day calendar, okay? So that means that all of the months are, are equal. Well, something changed. That is very clear because science shows us, and we know this from precise computer calculations, that there are 364.5 days in a year. Now, what caused this? Ah, that's the million dollar question. And this is what throws a curve to many people, okay? Because they might wanna continue to, to, you know, to, to, observe a what's what they call a zadok calendar even though there's no such thing as a zadok calendar you won't find that anywhere that word in hebrew means righteousness the men in qumran were not keeping a zadok calendar the men in qumran were more than likely sadducees pharisees Essenes, or levites john was a levite he was not called a zadok okay he was a he was a priest of the temple And the reason why he was in the wilderness is because at that time, it was a corrupted priesthood. It was Hellenized. This is why we got a man called Caiaphas as high priest. That is a a Jewish Hellenized name, which means it's Greek. Okay. At that time, and 150 years before that, the priesthood was, was basically a pay to play kind of thing, sort of like what we see in our modern day politics it wasn't it was not a legitimate priesthood 
we did not have legitimate priests in the in the uh, temple at the time of Yeshua, and this is why he come against the Pharisees at that time. They were Hellenized, you guys, and they brought in all kinds of heresies from Babylon, it, from the Talmud, in other words, right? So Yeshua came against them. But 150 years before that, during the time of Maccabees, when the Greeks came in and invaded is when that changed. You see what I'm saying? Okay. So 150 years before Yeshua and about 150 years after Yeshua is the complete time frame that there was anyone in Qumran. And we're talking about the Dead Sea Scrolls. Okay, a misconception about Dead Sea Scrolls, and they're finding two calendars in that. Some people like to take that information and twist it to their agenda. But let me explain to you what the archaeologists have found. They have found a solar calendar and a lunar calendar, and neither one can be reconciled um, by themselves. It takes both of them, both of them. Now. It's my opinion that the reason why we see this in Qumran is because something changed to cause us to go from a 365 to, excuse me, a 360 to a 364.5 day calendar. Something happened. Anybody want to guess what, what possibly was this cause of this, right? It was Planet X. Planet X has happened several times. It will happen again. It perturbated the, 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 the planet. It changed our rotation. It changed the moon from being 30 days to something else. We were, there, there were five days added to the calendar. This, this is something that can be proven by science, you guys. So it's not just the Bible and Bible codes. There are scientists that says there, there, there's a planet out there that has perturbed or perturbated our solar system so something changed and we can i believe we can see this at the crucifixion because the fact is when when we see in the scriptures that there was an eclipse at the crucifixion and we go and examine that and what is taking place right yeah, we, can, we can see that it's impossible for the moon to give us a three hour eclipse. It's a seven minute eclipse when there's a solar eclipse, you guys. It's not three hours. And so we see that there was an eclipse for three hours. There was an earthquake. And I don't believe it was just localized. Okay. And the reason I say that is because Velikovsky, who was a scientist, scientist in before my time, suggested that we look at other cultures to reconcile these, these, um, these things that's happened to our planet, catastrophic events. And so in doing that, we can go back in time and look at the, what the China, and by the way, Gil Broussard does this with the planet 7X. That's, that's upon his, his uh, that's, this is part of his um, methodology is looking at these different cultures and they record something happened in the, 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 scar, the skies at that time. So this is a thing that happened all around the world, not just Jerusalem. When we're reading in the Bible, there was a three hour eclipse and there was an earthquake and the, dam the damage that was done to the temple. You can expect this was a worldwide thing. The whole earth shook. Wouldn't that make sense that the son of the most high is on the cross and he's given his life the, the earth didn't just shake in jerusalem the whole earth shook okay so they recorded in japan uh, uh china in japan and other countries all around the world and if you go look at historically this this pattern we can see it right so what happened it was not the moon that did this the moon was in the wrong place it's in the wrong place in the solar system when this happened Okay, so it had to be something else. Planet X is in play here. So um, that is what perturbed our, our solar system and changed us from 365, excuse me, 360 to 364.5 days. That's what we, we see as a year. Okay, 
So it's, we're talking about five days added to a calendar. Doesn't seem like a whole lot. Really doesn't affect the agricultural too much, but it does affect it a little bit to the, to the point where something stands out. There was a change somewhere. There's no question about that. It's the same today. Nothing has changed since that time, since, since that time for, to, to my notion. Now, before that, we could possibly say that in the time of, of Noah, there was another perturbation, okay? And, and there's been a couple of others, right? So if this is a cyclical thing, something that's happening, it's, it's, it has an orbit, and every time it comes around, it, it does something to the earth, right? So there's been a handful of times that's, ha that's happened. The ones that stand out the most is Noah's flood and the crucifixion. And one other that comes to mind is Joshua's long day, okay, where you would move the, the clock uh, 10 degrees. So we can see that there's a cyclical thing that, that is happening that you is using, in other words, his creation. It's all about his creation. In other words, you was perfectly able to take his finger and stop the earth and make it stop 10 degrees, right? But that's not what he did. He used his creation to cause these things to happen. And the scripture says, what, what was before will happen again. So if there was a planet X at the crucifixion, you guys, it's my guess that when he comes again, there's gonna be a planetary system involved. And we're gonna see most likely the fulfillment of the Isaiah 24. And if you don't know what Isaiah 24 talks about, go and read that. That, that has never happened before. The earth has never been turned upside down and tossed to and fro like a drunkard okay but that is yet to come and if you look at that with in, with science eyes because he is the creator of science science does not disprove the bible it confirms the bible okay but scientists will use that to twist the knowledge to try to prove that there's no there's no such thing as a god right but if you look at that with science eyes and with biblical understanding you can see that he's using his creation in this, okay? So something happened. We got 4.5 days added to, the, to the, the calendar. That's that's no argument about that. That is a fact, okay? But when the solar system equalized, we still end up with 29.5 days per month. Why do I say that? Because Psalm 104, 19 is the truth. The moon determines the Moedim. So we're talking about the calendar. Yahuwah's clock, okay? If you walked into your house and you got a clock on your wall, you don't know what time it is. You happen to walk into the room and you look over at the clock and you see it's what is 6.15. You've just reconciled what time it is. Does that mean you worship the clock? Absolutely not, you guys. And the reason I'm saying that is because there are some that suggest that is if you reconcile the, the time using Yahuwah's clock and, and observe the moon, you're worshiping the moon. That is not what's happening. Don't do not be tricked, you guys, with, with this very lame argument, okay? It's a clock. The very first chapter of Genesis tells you why you have created this. And by the way, he did not create the Shabbat on the very first week of creation, even though it says he rested in the seventh day. He was given us a pattern of the seventh day, but he was not establishing the Shabbat until Exodus 16. This is the First time you see you will give the Shabbat, the workday, and the new moon to man is when they come out of Egypt. Okay, so put that stuff to rest. That is one of the most common arguments with people who oppose this particular calendar. They say, well, you got to start at uh, Genesis. No, you don't. Why? Because he gives it to us at G Exodus 16. That's really clear. There's no question about that. When they come out of Egypt, 
They're full of Egypt and all of Egypt and its uh, teachings. And he tells Moses, I'm going to test the people to see if they're going to keep my word and keep my commandments. So what does he do? He gives us the work week, collecting manna, the Shabbat, but it's also he's given us the, the new moon. All in that, in that week. And you guys, I can prove the calendar just from that chapter alone. So if there's anyone that tells you that you got to go to Jubilees to get this information, they're misleading you. Jubilees does not hold any high regard over the, the Torah. We have to say that. Now, Jubilees is interesting to read. It's wonderful to glean from, but to create doctrine is bad hermeneutics. And the reason I say that is because most scholars, and this is a fact, you can, you can Google this, most scholars agree that Jubilees has been tampered with. And the word interloper is used. What the word interloper means is you have two authors of Jubilees and they, they disagree. They do that. There are 28 con uh, contradictions in Jubilees, which doesn't make any sense. And this doesn't make any sense in the scriptures to me with Paul and the Torah either until I figured out what was going on. The fact that if you don't understand Paul, it seems like he does this with the Torah. He contradicts the Torah. There, this cannot be. It's the same thing with the calendar, you guys. There's no contradictions. So what does this mean? There are 28 contradictions in Jubilees. So scholars agree that the contradictions come from an eight century Jewish rabbi, and I can't think of his name, but he's French. He decides to take upon himself to rewrite Jubilees, except he doesn't do a thorough job. He actually leaves uh, instances where there's contradictions. He chooses to change things all about the calendar. Every single one of the contradictions is about the calendar. So you'll, re you'll read one way on the calendar this way, and then read later something 180 degrees different. Now, if there's one author of Jubilees, this wouldn't be the case. But because we know historical fact and scholars know, they know his name, which one this was. And I, I apologize, I'm not prepared to tell you his name during this, but he is a French Jewish rabbi in the eighth century that took it upon himself to change Jubilees. This is why the Catholic Church, and I'm not condoning what the Catholic Church did with the canon, but this is the primary reason why the, the Catholic Church did not include it in the canon. It's because of the contradictions. So right off the bat, we cannot use Jubilees exclusively like some people do. There are some people who use Jubilees exclusively to establish a calendar. This is bad hermeneutics. Hermeneutics, hermeneutics means the study of the, the scriptures or the interpretation of the scriptures. It's bad. When you got another book outside of the, the scriptures that contradicts the word, and not only does Jubilees contradict itself, it contradicts what it says in the word, meaning the Torah, we cannot use it. We can glean from it. We can glean historical things from it, but we can't establish a doctrine. If that was the case, it would be like me using the Talmud. Get this. This would be like me using the Talmud to debunk the New Testament. That's what it equates to, you guys, that we use the Jub Jubilees to debunk what it says in the Torah. We cannot do this. This is bad hermeneutics period. I have to say that, okay? So if you're reading Jubilees, and I don't discourage you from reading Jubilees, there's good information there, but you have to understand what you're reading and, and what is contradictive, okay? Because it can cause conundrum in your, in your own thinking, right? This happened to me where I'm, same thing with the, with the Bible, where I'm seeing contradictions with Paul. 
and I didn't understand what was going on. Peter even tells us, Paul's understand, uh, Paul is hard to understand unless you know what he's saying, okay? So keep that in mind. When you're trying to reconcile what it says in the Torah and what it says in the Jubilees, the Torah always takes precedence. We cannot go with what it says in Jubilees because it can't be trusted. It's been established with historical reference and with, with historians and scholars. There are two different writers in Jubilees and they oppose each other. So I just need to say that, right? So it's the moon that determines the Moedim. It's the moon that determines the Shabbat. It's the moon that d determines new moon day. Here's the thing about new moon day. There are two different ways that we can see in the Hebrew community that people are reconciling the calendar. And so we need to establish the correct way right now so there's no confusion. All right. There's a word in Hebrew called kaseth. Kaseth means concealed. Now, King James has conveniently misinterpreted this word. If you look at it in the Strongs, it'll, it'll show you something to the extent of, of Kaseth means full of light, which this is why they say the, the new moon is full moon, okay? That's not so. That word means concealed. If you have a concealed moon, does that mean it's full? If you, if you walk outside and you've seen a full moon, does, does it look to you like it's concealed? No. They like to do mental gymnastics with this word. And, and this is the devil in the details, you guys. He likes to get into the details and obscure things and, and to make things confusing. And let me just say this. There are people that I love that are on the opposite calendar I am on the, on the solar loony, meaning that they observe new moon as the full moon, which is wrong. I love those guys. Mikhail Scriptures the brother that does a really good thorough teaching teaches that the new moon is full moon. You can't reconcile the new moon as a full moon. If, if you walk outside at full moon time, two days before or two days after, you cannot tell if it's full or if it's partial full, if it's got one degree left to go before it's full, you can't, you can't reconcile that. It's, in, it's, it's nearly impossible to do that but they do and so it doesn't make any sense to me why they do that because it's clear to me that the moon cycle is a life and death cycle it mirrors man by the way the new moon is no moon into a crescent to a to a growing full moon which is the fullness of life and then it wanes out to to nothing which is the latter years of your life. It is the mirror image of the lifespan of man, you guys. You start, there is no light, and then there's a little bit of light. And then it grows into fullness, which is the prime of your life. And then it wanes to nothing. <clears throat> this is exactly the life cycle of man. To start new moon at full moon, you only confuse, confusing yourself because the two days before and the two days after, try this this month, by the way. Go outside and look at the moon two days before full moon and two days after and see if you can tell any difference in the moon. It's very difficult because when we're talking about 2% and 1%, you guys, you gotta, you got to have like a you got to have like sharp vision and like computer analysis and all that kind of thing to, to reconcile that. But it's very easy to reconcile the moon when there's no moon and it grows to a crescent, to a waning, uh, to a gibbous, to full moon, to a waning gibbous, to another crescent. Okay. That's the life cycle of man. Let me stop right here. I see we got a question from um, Wendy. Shalom, Wendy. It's good to see you here. Shalom. You. Thank you. Yep. How, how, how do you spell cassette? Cassette in the in the um, um, English phonetic would be K E S E F. Excuse me. S E F. Okay. S, S E H. Excuse me. Cassette. 
cassette. I don't know what not what what the Strong's concordance number is, but it means hidden okay. or concealed. Right. I'll look it up in Strong's. Now, some of the some of the King James people and and those that keep a full moon as as the new moon will say it's concealed in light. That doesn't make any sense to me. Light is is shining and it's there's no concealing that it's it's everybody sees it but when there's no moon that's a concealed moon it's a hidden moon now this is really important because when we get to the most important day of the father which is um uh, shavuot that's a hidden day this is the one one day on the calendar of his feast that there's no full moon you see a full moon at sukkot time and you see a full moon at Passover, but at Shavuot, there's no moon at all. It means it's hidden from you, right? And so, incidentally, in book, the book of Acts, it does not say 10 days later they were celebrating Pentecost. We got to get away from this word Pentecost because it's a misnomer, it's misleading. And I've shown that here recently with the growth cycle of wheat. It's impossible. You guys, I will, I'll give you a million dollars. If you can grow wheat, harvest wheat, thresh that wheat, make that wheat into flour, and then bake that wheat into two loaves and wave it in 50 days. That's a challenge if you would like to take it. And the reason I could say that with confidence because it's impossible to get two loaves after you've grown that wheat in just 50 days <clears throat> it is shocking to me that there's been no grain producer that is a believer even a christian in 2000 years that has a step forward and said wait hey hey guys i gotta tell you something you can't do that in 50 days the reason being it takes more than 100 days to grow wheat I know this because I spent three years, you guys, studying nothing but wheat in the growth cycle. Of it. I've sp spoken to grain producers. So this is a contentious point between myself and another ministry currently right now is the growth cycle of wheat and how I posed the, uh, the, you know, the proposal that it's impossible to grow wheat in 50 days you know, harvest it, thresh it, turn it into flour and produce two loaves to wave to the father in just 50 days. It's impossible. So something's going on here. Okay. It is my opinion that the father preserved this particular day, which was the, the very first Shavuot. Aaron produces a, a bull for us to worship. Okay. Yahuwah says he's going to destroy the people. Moses says, please don't do that. Yada, yada, yada. He comes down. He, shut, he, he destroys the two tablets. He goes back up on the mountain. He, he reestablishes another covenant with him. It, it, was a, it was a catastrophe. But because of that first one, I believe the father obscured that day. He even, he even allowed translators and Christian apologists to make it even more obscure, to hide that day. Why? Why is that? Because it's, it is so important. It's a day that he opens the door, the, the windows of heaven. And he pours out his blessing. The, the very one that happened in the upper room, and incidentally, the caveat for what happened on that day is every single one of them were in what? One mind and one accord. They weren't all over the place with the calendar. There wasn't five different ways to reconcile the And currently, that's what we see in the Hebrew community. Five different ways to reconcile the calendar. They weren't divided like that. One mind, one accord. And what do we see on the very day? He pours out his spirit upon them. So we got to get it right. This is why it's, in, it's critical. We get it right. In my prayer. And in my uh, fasting about that day, that's what he's revealed to me, that this is when it will happen again, is when we were in one mind and one accord. So this is encouraging to me to see this class full of, of people who are interested in learning this calendar. 
And since I've been on it, I've been on it, this is going into my seventh year, I've seen more and more people coming to the lunar solar calendar. And from my experience and what he's revealed to me, you guys, and he's brought, oh my gosh, he has brought so many witnesses. This, this past week in Florida, I met an 80-year-old man named Walter. And one of the things we talked about was, was Shabbat. And I said, you know, we were talking about the 8, 15, 22, and 29 being the Shabbat, and that's established in Exodus 16. But I said, brother, have you ever looked at what, what's going on with Shavuot? And he said, what do you mean that it's later than we've been taught? And I just come unglued. I was like, oh, my gosh, tell me more. What do you mean? Yeah, it's later. Oh. Yeah. He said the same exact thing. It's more than 100 days. So the Holy Spirit had revealed to him the very same thing. Now, because we, we are people who have been pulled away from agriculture. In other words, 100 years ago, more than likely, all of our families would have been farmers. They would have produced their own crops. And they would have been very familiar with planting seasons and how the moon operates in all this, right? They would have been very aware of when to plant and when to harvest wheat. But because we have modern day conveniences, we're no longer a agricultural driven people. We're commerce driven. We're, we're driven by currency, right? We have lost that. And so most people have no idea that Pentecost is a misnomer. They go to their churches. They hear the preachers talking about Pentecost and, and what happened in X, uh, the book of Acts and so on. And they never question. This is something that blew my mind when you were revealed this to me. And I'm sitting here looking at this information. I'm thinking in 2000 years, there's been not one farmer, one grain producer to say this is impossible. Not one. I'm sure they have been, but we've never heard of them. And this is the work of the enemy to obscure this day. Same thing about the name. If the Bible says we're two or more gathering in his name, there I will be also. Don't you know he's the enemy somewhere in his playbook of wrongdoing? There's somewhere in there. It's probably the first page that says we got to change the name of the father and the son. Well, folks, that happened roughly about 500 years ago with Jesus and God, right? This is what we got instead of the father's name and the son's name. There's a motive to that. There's a reason why the enemy did that. Now, this other this other issue, the the day of Shavuot, which is when the Holy Spirit is poured out upon the, those in the upper room. This is another threat to the kingdom of Satan. And so it, it stands to reason why he would obscure this day and make it confusing to people because he absolutely knows what was done before is going to happen again so if we ever figure this out he's done he's done completely done that's why it's critical that we get this down okay so um, that's a big motivator for me to uh to do these class so the very first thing we have to learn is the moon and its purpose. Okay. Babylon did not create the moon. Yahuwah did. And he tells us in Genesis 1 the reason why he did. And then we see in, in Psalm 104, 19, what the function is. The moon regulates the Moedim. Now, that, that, moon, that word, Moedim, has multiple meanings. It means Shabbat, new moons. And feast days, the three days described in the Bible. So that's where I want to start with today's lesson is we're going to understand the moon and its function. Okay, you guys. So if there's any questions as I go along, just, just you know, as uh, Marty did, raise your hand uh, virtually there and I'll try to answer it. But otherwise, I'm going to read the information that I have from you from Troy Miller. Now, Troy Miller happens to be my source that I'm going to cite. It's, it's not where I learned this, but it's a confirmation. Here's the thing. I specialize in codes, 
that's what I know front and back. And so if you have a heart condition, you guys, you go to a heart specialist, right? Well, if we're going to learn about the calendar, we're going to go to those who are specializing in the calendar. And that is Troy Miller, in my opinion, in this, um, in this uh, endeavor. So the very first thing is that we're going to talk about the three categories or three days mentioned in the scripture, which is the moon. Okay, so we're going to read that. And then we'll take any kind of questions and go into um, conversation after that. All right. So very first, it says tour observers very astutely and correctly say that when the words or commandments or statutes and judgments appear in the same passage of scripture, that they cannot be referring to the same thing. These are three separate divisions of Yahuwah's codified law, and there are not two moral and ceremonial as taught as commonly taught the penmen of these passages were not saying 10 commandments and 10 commandments and 10 commandments the two divisions of law moral and ceremonial were invented to stem the tide of reformation and is the work of the catholic scholar thomas aquinas that said please consider the following when work days new moons and sabbaths appear in the same passage is it ever possible that these days do concur concurrently occupy the same 24-hour period of time or do these day fall into three separate categories it is of note that the eighth of excuse me that the eighth or the passages that mention the feast days, new moons and Sabbaths, are, are listings them comparatively as they are similar in nature. They are all appointed times, Moedim. However, the passages below mention that the different types of days contrast the work days as being very different from worship days, unequal to the new moon or Sabbath days. They're not similar in nature. Thus says the sovereign Yahuwah, the gate of the inner court, looketh toward the east, shall be shut in the six working days. Okay, so this is this is very very clear. We're talking about six working days, but now we're going to see another day. But on the Sabbath, right? That's a, that's day. That's another. That's a second day mentioned. But the Sabbath. It shall be open and in the day of the new moon. It's not reiterating here. It's not saying the Sabbath and the new moon is, is as part of the same day. It's saying the work days, the Sabbaths, and the new moons. So this is something we have to understand. The new moon is a set apart day. It's a day unto itself. It is also called Rosh Chodesh, which means head of the month. It separates the month, the end of one month and the beginning of another month. And it can be one or two days. This is why it takes a witness to reconcile this. We're supposed to go every month, not just the seventh month, and reconcile this. In other words, see the moon and declare the new moon. And we blow the shofar. And what do we do? We have a feast. We have a grand dinner. Every new moon, you guys, that's what we're commanded to do. And that's not a big deal. That's not like a thing we can't do. I mean, who doesn't like to eat, right? The Father has commanded that at new moon time, we are to have a feast. It's a, it's a day that sets apart it from any other day. It's not a Sabbath day. It's not a work day. In other words, it is a non-commerce day. It's very similar to a Sabbath day, but we can work. We can't do serve our work. In other words, we can't go to our job and work or earn money, but we can work around our home and do things where you're not earning money. Okay. That's what it means not by non-commerce. We don't spend money on this day. It's a set of, it's a worship day. We're to have a feast and to worship and to reconcile that moon by blowing the shofar when we see the sliver of the moon. That could be either day one or day two. We have to wait. Now, I'm going to show you in scripture later how David and Jonathan reconciled this day just like that. That there was a feast happening 
that Saul expected David to be there. And, and you'll see in the scriptures that, that it was after day three that he appeared. Okay. So thus saith the sovereign Yehua, at the gate of the inner court. Where's my the look at toward the east shall be shut in six working days, but on the Sabbath it shall be open. And in the day of the new moon, three days, you can find this in Ezekiel 46, 1 and verse 3, right? What happens if the new moon falls on a Tuesday on man's calendar? Is the gate open or shut? There's no right answer. The solution is that the new moon never falls on a work day because it's not a work day. It's a third category of day. The gate is closed on all six works days. This passage in Ezekiel is the only one in scripture that mentions all three days in the same passage. But the following passages very clearly impl imply that the work days are separate from the new moon days and Sabbaths. In context of the passage, it was during the work day that the Sh uh, Shumanite woman's husband asked, wherefore wilt thou go unto him today? It is neither new moon nor Sabbath. You can find that in 2 Kings 4.23. Future work days will also be observed as separate from the worship days. And, it's, and it says, and it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another, from one Sabbath to another, shall all flesh come worship before me, saith Yahuwah. That's Isaiah 66, 23. By the way, this is in the, this is in the old kingdom, but also in, in the new kingdom that's to come. This is something that's going to happen in the millennial time that we will have new moon days and Shabbats that we have to reconcile. Okay, and that's the whole world, not just the Hebrews, right? Future work days will also be observed as separate from worship days. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another, all flesh, all flesh, not just Hebrews, all flesh shall come to worship before you say it. You would. Isaiah 66, 23. Right? So all flesh will be required to come and worship before him. The new moon is not a weekly Sabbath. The new moon is a non-commerce day. A commerce day is not a worship day. Right? The Sabbath and the new moon are worship days. Do the math. You will discover that there are three separate categories of Yahuwah's calendar, new moon days, work days, and Sabbath. And since scripture indicates that these days cannot take place at the same time. In other words, don't, don't try to do mind gymnastics and, and tell yourself that um, these days are, are synonymous. They are not synonymous. They're three separate days, okay? New moon days, work days, and Sabbath, since scripture indicates that these days cannot take place at the same time, do not overlap or share the same space. Then we need to rework our understanding of the calendar. Clearly, the Gregorian calendar is not ordained by Yahuwah. And by the way, the Gregorian calendar is only about 1,500 years old, you guys. This is not the calendar that Yeshua was on. Crazy, huh? which is six work days, and we're talking about Monday through Friday, Saturday, Sunday. No, there was something called the Julian calendar at the time of Yeshua, which means there was eight days in the week. And Saturday was the first day of the week. It was not the Shabbat. So anybody keeping the Shabbat on Saturday is wrong. And, and that goes without saying, okay? Most believe that the first day of creation was when light was created. But unless I have misread something in heaven and earth was created before light, there's a universal truth. Without time, there is no motion. Without motion, there is no time. Thus, the creation of heaven and earth mentioned in Genesis 1, 1 through 2, was a time-consuming event. Something moved. Something appeared out of nothing. And since it is a time-consuming event, where should it be placed on the calendar? Let me, let me propose something to you. 
when there's no light and suddenly there's light, we're not talking about the birth of the sun. We're talking about what? The birth of the moon. Now that's crazy because the moon is what is reflected from the sun. But the way it's described, we can see clearly, if you have the eyes to see, that the first crescent of the moon is the first light. That's what's implied here. Okay. So let's look at that. New moon in Genesis 1 and 2. We see day one on the count on the, the monthly calendar. Day one of the week is day two of the month. Why is that? Anybody know why? Day one of the week is day two of the monthly calendar. It's two different counts going on here. Okay, so day one is not day one of the month. Everybody see that? This is why in Jubilees, you'll end up with two day, uh, excuse me, 10 days extra if you don't reconcile the new moon. Day one is day two on the calendars. Do you, everyone see what I'm saying? You have a new moon day, and then day one of the first work week would be day two of the monthly calendar. Everybody see that? So synonymously, as you're counting or reconciling the month, you're going to be doing it uh, two different ways. Day one of the calendar is day two, excuse me, day one of the week is day two of the calendar. Why? Because day one is always new moon day. Everybody see that? Why is that so? Because the Bible says it's a set apart day. It is not a part of the monthly count. It sets apart the two months. It's the middle part. It's the, the whole pattern between months. Rosh Kodesh means head of the month. It also means new month in the Bible. Don't be confused by that. Okay. But we're separating the months. In other words, the month before and the month after is separated by new moon day. So once we identify new moon day, whether it's one or two, now we count the week of the month. Is everybody following me? Okay. This is where a lot of people get confused, particularly because the first Shabbat of the month is on the eighth day. And, and most people who can't understand it say, well, Jonathan, the, the Bible clearly says that the Shabbat is on the seventh day. That is true. But it's the eighth day of the month. It, that is a fact. Courtney, you got a question. Yeah, um, I just wanted to have something clarified. Yeah. It, could you clarify the difference between uh, Shabbat and New Moon Day as far as like what work you're allowed to do, what you're not allowed to do? Yes. Okay. So New Moon Days are non-commerce days. We're not allowed to spend money and we're not allowed to go work for servile. In other words, your job, right? But you're allowed to do work at your home. You're allowed to prep, you know, prepare meals. You're allowed to do cleaning and anything, any kind of work where you're not earning a paycheck. That's a non-servile work. And that also applies to some of the feast days. Like during Passover week and Sukkot week, there are certain days that are not high Shabbats that you're allowed to do preparation work. You're allowed to, to cook meals. You're allowed to cook the lamb and things like this. You're not earning any kind of, of money. Now, if you're going to work and you're going to, let's say you work at a pharmacy and you're going to work the whole week of, of Shavuot, you're breaking Torah there because you're going to do servile work. Now, if you take taken off of working at the pharmacy and you're just, you're cooking your lamb and you're cleaning your house and you're, you're, you're preparing for your guests and all that to come. That's different than going to work and er earning a paycheck, okay? Completely different. So Shabbat, you do absolutely no work. No servile work and no preparation work. If you're doing preparation work, it's one day before Shabbat, okay? Many people do that. But the day of Shabbat, we're supposed to rest. We're supposed to worship. We are studying the word. We're listening to worship music and things like that. We're resting, okay? Completely resting. No, doing absolutely no work, all right? But these other days, like 
like non-commerce days, you can't earn money. You can't, you can't bring in a, a paycheck, but you can do like, you can wash dishes, you can cook meals, you can do preparation, you can clean your house, you can do all these things that are not serve, you're not serving someone else, in other words. So that's the difference between new moon day and Shabbat. Okay, everybody clear? So that's the difference of it. It is two different days, by the way. Some people think that new moon day is a Shabbat. It's kind of like a Shabbat, but not exactly. And, and, and for that reason, you can do servile work on new moon days. But the fact is, it is a set apart day. It separates the month. And in Hebrew, it's called Rosh Kodesh, the head of the month. We are identifying the next month phase. And because it's two, it can be two days or one day, we have to do this. We have to, to reconcile that because it's not in when it was 360 day years, you didn't have to do this. You, it was automatic. Does that make sense? But because of perturbation and something changed in our solar system, now we have the possibility of a two day um, new moon. And this is because the rotation of the moon is elliptical. It's not a circuit. It's not a circle. It's, it's like an egg. So some months it can be two days, some months it can be one day. Okay. Now, if we don't observe that, this is where the, the author in Jubilee says that if you don't observe the new moons correctly, I'm paraphrasing here, you'll end up with a roughly 10 days extra in your, your count. That's why. It's because you're only counting one of the new moon days and they're accumulating over a period of time. By the time you get to the end of the year, you've got roughly 10, sometimes in some years, 11 days extra in your count. Incidentally, when you fix the calendar, like the Hillel calendar and, and the Zadok calendar does, you have to do what's called intercalation, which means every so often you've got to add what? You've got to add a week. Some In some observance, you add a whole month, right? This is because of the accumulation of those days, of new, and it's always the new moon days. It's not because they, they you know, all of a sudden miss some, some Shabbat days and they're all of, they're accumulating. No, it is always the new moon reconciliation, whether it's one day or two days in every count, okay? So just be clear on that. So here we have a diagram where it shows us the work week that shows us the new moon, the work week, and the Sabbath day. Now, you can find this in Exodus 16, which is really clear to me. This is where you revealed it to me for the first time. I got it. I could see it clearly when I saw that. And I was like, oh, my gosh, I couldn't believe I couldn't see this before. And I'm not the only one that saw this. My brother, Daryl Lee, on uh, Facebook, the very same chapter, he did the same thing to him. And, it, and when I see him testify, it, it, it warms my heart, you guys, to see that because it, it reminds me of when I reconciled the calendar. It was the very same chapter. And it's a simple mathematics. If they left Egypt on the 15th day and it took them one month to get to a lean, which is on the other side of the Red Sea. And Yahuwah says to them, you know, I'm going to test them. I'm going to give them my Shabbat, my work week, my new moon, my Ten Commandments, and going to see what they're going to do. Now, notice that they're not at Sinai yet. They're not at Sinai yet. Yahuwah's come from Sinai and met them along the way, and this is in a place called Sin, where he introduces them to them to this. This is where the whole Pentecost thing gets kind of confusing for people because this they believe this is where the law was given. No, that's not. This is where he introduces them to the Ten Commandments and to the work week, new moon, and Shabbat. Right? And even when he did that, there were some that went away stray from what he said specifically. It's attention to detail. With the who it's always Attention to detail is important. If we miss that, we can, get, we can get off and get in trouble. But he said he was going to test us. So he gives us the new moon day. They got there on the 15th. 
he gives them quail to eat at the evening of the 15th, but he tells them on the 16th, which is the notice, it's the 16th day of the month and the first day of the week for them to work. So we got two counts, okay? 15th day, 16th day of the month and the first work day, which means what? It's number two. It's not, it's not the, it's not um, like day one, day two, day three, all the way to day seven. So in other words, the very first day of the month is a part of this count that runs you to day seven, right? Of the count, but but day eight is the seventh day of the of the count because we started on day two, the sixteenth, right? So if you want to look, we were right here. The sixteenth is the very first day he gives the work day. So when we count that, the next day is the seventeenth, the next day is the eighteenth, the next day is the nineteenth, the twentieth, the twenty one, twenty one, and this is day six where he says to to gather twice as much on the sixth day well well when he gives that to us day six is day 21 on the calendar okay so there's two counts going on the monthly count and the weekly count we have to keep that in mind and the reason for that is the set apart day called new moon if you just blow fat past new moon day as another day of the week guess what you end up with 10 extra days every year extra just exactly what it says in Jubilees. If you don't understand the calendar, you're going to end up with 10 extra days. This is why you have to set it apart. Blowing the shofar, doing a, doing a feast. It's a set apart day. We're worshiping you on that day. But if you observe it correctly, day six of week three, and this is week three of the month, brings you to day 21. Guys, if you go to Exodus 16 and you count from day 15, he gives you that the, the, they're resting on Shabbat on day 15. And he says, you're going to start tomorrow and you're going to collect manna and you're going to do this for six days and collecting twice as much on the sixth day and resting on the seventh. Now, this is not the seventh day of the month. It's the eighth day of the month, but the seventh day of the work week. The work week is, is different than, than there are four work weeks in the month. And because we got the new moon day, that's going to throw it off one number. Keep that in mind. It's always one number because of that set apart day. So that brings us to day 21. In other words, if you go to Exodus 16, I don't believe it's a mistake or coincidence that he does Exodus 16 and he starts us on the work week when he gives us the calendar on the 16th day of the month, it lines up. Start counting from there. 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. That's six days. The seventh day is day 22. Now, if you understand this and understand that they were on this pattern for 40 years, once you who have started this pattern, they're on it for 40 years nonstop. Nonstop, which means what? which means every seventh day will be 8, 15, 22, 29, every month. Every month, Yahuwah Shabbat will be 8, 15, 22, 29. Now, here's, here's the misnomer, that if you're just doing a seven-day count, it's going to be 7, 14, 21, and 29. That's, that's a, another kind of mathematics. What's the difference? New moon day. You're not considering new moon day. It's a set apart day. We have to observe it. But we also have to add it in our, in our monthly count, not the weekly count, the monthly count. So since we started on day 16 of the month, day one of the count of the count for work week is going to be 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. That's six days. Day seven is 22. You guys. That is the Torah. That is the Torah, and I can prove the calendar from one chapter. The fact that somebody's got to go to Jubilees and they do mental gymnastics and tell you this and that, and still it's obscure, proves nothing to me. This is why I'm fervent about this. 
8, 15, 22, 29. Anytime you see the, the Shabbat mentioned in the Bible, it's going to be one of those days. And just from the Torah alone, you can prove seven months consecutively that it's 8, 15, 22, 29. No other calendar, not Hillel's calendar, not, not the Zadok calendar, which is, which is essentially the, the Hillel calendar. Because every day is Saturday, is for their Shabbat. It's essentially the same thing. None of those calendars ever come up with 8, 15, 29, uh, 8, 15, 22, 29 every month. It's impossible. It doesn't happen. It floats all over the place. It's different every month. Okay. As far as days, not, not days of the month, not days of the week. In other words, on Hillel's calendar and Zadok's calendar, Zadok, I don't, I don't even believe there's something legitimately called Zadok. I think it's a, it's a catchphrase that people like to, to call a day. Anyway, it's always Saturday. That means it's a fixed calendar. It does not reconcile the moon. It doesn't even consider the moon at all, which goes against the Bible. The Bible says in Psalm 104, 19, the moon determines the Moedin. How does that happen? How does that happen unless you observe the moon? How do you observe it? New moon time at, at conjunction where there's no moon, cassette. There's no moon at all. And we're in a whole pattern. Now we are in what's called an appointed time between you and the father and, and another witness to reconcile the month, Rosh Kodesh. And when you see that sliver, you know it's day one. And when, it's day, when that day one happens, every day after that, that, are, that is seven days apart. In other words, when day, let's say day one is a certain day, um, seven days later, you're going to see the, the Shabbat. Seven days later, you're going to see, it, it, it always determines the Shabbat. So whatever day it falls on, if it falls on a Monday in a month, every Monday of that month is going to be Shabbat. If it happens on a Tuesday, and we're talking about Gregorian calendar, if it ha if day one happens on a Tuesday, every day after that on a Tuesday is Shabbat. If it happens on a Friday, every Friday after that is going to be Shabbat. Everybody follow me on this. But on Yahuwah's calendar, it will always be 8, 15, 22, and 29. So that is how you look at the Gregarian and Yahuwah's calendar at the same time. Is everybody clear and understand that? And this is where a lot of confusion comes in because it flips on the month. You know why that is? You know why there's motion on the Gregarian calendar every month for, for Yahuwah's calendar? It's because the moon is not a circular motion. It has an elliptical motion, so it can be one or two days. This is why it flips. Interesting how that happens, right? So we cannot count every Saturday of every month as Yahuwah's Shabbat. That does not fly if the moon determines the Moedim, you guys, because it will not fall perfectly on Saturday every month. Not if the moon determines the Moedim. It's going gonna, it's gonna to move. Why? Because the moon moves. It moves in an in a elliptical pattern. So on a fixed calendar, it's going to move, right? So some months it might be Monday. Some months it might be Tuesday. Some it might be Friday. It's because the moon is moving and it's not always one day. Sometimes it's two days. And next month it might be another two days. And next month it might be another two days. And then it's another one day. Then another one day. So it's never the same every month. We have to reconcile that new moon time. So this is important. If we don't, if we don't consider new moon, you, your whole calendar will be off completely. That goes for the, the, the same ones that are on the lunar solar calendar, but they're, also, they're observing new moon as, as full moon because observing full moon as new moon is very difficult. Like I said, two days before and two days after, it's hard to see the moon as full. You could, you could say two days before it was a full moon, but then it, for three days in a row, it looks like it's full. It's like, okay, which day was it, right? Can you see how that can get kind of obscured there and you can be off two or three days so it will move around a little bit for those guys, 
But if you observe it at, from the beginning at Rosh Kodesh, where there's no moon, and then you see the first crescent, and that's when you start your count, it will be precise every month, you guys. Every month. I've been on it for years and never have missed a, a feast day or, or a day's got kind of crazy. We had to intercalate and add a week and all that kind of stuff. Guess why? Because we account for the new moon. And so you always count, even though there's a different solar system that we had from a 360 to 364.5, the, the solar system equated itself. It, it equalized, in other words. And so now we have a 29.5 day count between each month. Okay, does that make sense? So it stands firm with what the Bible says. 8, 15, 22, 29. You guys, there's one chapter in Exodus proves this. I don't have to go all over the Bible. One chapter. It's a slam dunk, you guys. 8, 15, 22, 29. So let's go on. As I said in the previous page, the new moon is a third category of day. Creation week proves it. The verses on the page above, above act as a second witness to this fact. There is no new moon anywhere in the scripture that falls on a weekday. Indeed, the new moon interrupts the seventh day count. But where in scripture is it stated that the seven day week runs consecutively without interruption? This goes for people who, who want to claim that since creation's time, that there's a seven day count consecutively that's uninterrupted. Now, if you do that, you basically have Hillel's calendar. It doesn't it doesn't observe the moon at all. So you get you get with a fixed day and it's the same day every month. Let's say it's Saturday, right? Doesn't consider the month at all. Over time, because we don't observe that new moon day, guess what you're going to get? You're going to get an accumulation of days which will throw your calendar off through the years. Currently on the Hillel calendar, we are 230 years off of the actual year that we're in. Does everybody understand that? That's a fact. The Jews even admit this. And they will even tell you it's because they don't observe the moon anymore. They used to. And I'll tell you when it changed. It changed under Constantine in the year 325. Constantine wrote an edict that, that said that the Jews will no longer observe new moon days. Shabbats or counting of weeks, which is really important because this is what's preserved in the wheat. Shabbat, we and, and through the Christian uh, translations, we get this thing called Pentecost, which means to count fifty. And because of that, it's obscured. Yahuwah's holy day is obscured. If you're only counting fifty, you're ended up at somewhere around May. Well, if you go to look at a wheat field in, in May, it's green. It's nowhere near harvest. Now it makes sense to you why I've been posting the videos about wheat fields in July. The mid-month, matter, matter of fact, July 15th, I'm driving across the United States and there's wheat field after wheat field after wheat field after state after state after state. Everyone that grows wheat, every one of them are growing wheat at the same time. Not only that, but I saw a CNN report of Russians dropping bombs in a wheat field in Ukraine one day after I'm driving across the United States looking at wheat fields that are ready for harvest. You guys, the reason for that is because there's something called a grain belt that runs all the way across the, the world. It doesn't matter what country you're in. If you're growing wheat, it's at the same time every year. You're planting at the same time Nebraska's plant, planting, which means you're going to be harvesting at the same time. Nebraska. If you're in Israel, if you're in Ukraine, or if you're in, you know, um, Great Britain, which, by the way, you gave me a third witness the other day when I was watching this brother's channel on YouTube and they had finished their harvest of wheat. And look where we are. It's, it's the end of the harvest season. Incidentally, if you look at the constellation Virgo, which we're in right now, what does she have in her hand? 
she has a clutch of wheat in her hand, which it's a harvest season. Happens every year, no matter where you are in the world. And now I mean, uh, in the, uh, in the, um, so this is another thing, whether you believe in flat earth or ball earth, because in the Southern hemisphere, it's exactly the reverse of that. The harvest and the growth season in Australia is December, January, and February, which is our winter time, right? So it's exactly the opposite in the Southern hemisphere, okay? So it's, it, and when I say the whole earth, I, and that, that's not necessarily true. There's there's a southern hemisphere in the, in the northern hemisphere, and it's the exact mirror opposite in that time when it's winter for us, meaning December, January, and February. It's summertime for Australia, and they are in fact growing wheat and harvesting wheat in summer, which proves the Bible. The Bible says that wheat is harvested in the summer. It is not harvested in the spring which is Pentecost, you guys. There's something wrong with that. It's called a misnomer. If you don't know what that means, go look at what that word means. It's a misunderstanding. It's a misinterpretation of what it means, okay? So uh, wheat is always a summer grain. Now, now, you know what did something in that for me? I had to go and study it for three years until I figured it out, why this was why this, this was standing out to me like this. And it's, it's, the reason is he hid his holy day in the growth cycle of wheat because somebody was going to come along in the end days and figure it out and say, hey, guys, guess what? <laughs> We're celebrating this day in the wrong time. He purposed that. He had purpose in that. I'm not the only one. World's Last Chance. There, Walter, I met in Florida. We all came to the same conclusion. So, you know, I'm a part of a very select few that figured this out. And I'm nobody. I'm a little peon. The fact that he revealed this to me is staggering to me. But it's the truth. He preserved it in the growth cycle of wheat. And so it would never change. Man did not manipulate wheat and, and how it grows. And if you if if he did, it's called GMO. Okay. And and by the way, Israel leads the world with America with GMO grains, but that's beside the point. The fact is, the growth cycle of wheat, according to the Bible, is more than 100 days. Okay, so that brings us which, with Pentecost or Shavuot to another 52 days after what the Christians were celebrating. Okay, that is a very important point that we have to understand. And this proves his calendar. All right, so indeed, the new moon interrupts the seventh day we count, but where in scripture is it stated that seven days run consecutively without interruption? It doesn't say that anywhere. It does not say that anywhere that it's a seventh day consecutive count since creation. That is a man made assumption. And they love to harp on that, but they can't show me a scripture. Because Yehud does not give us the calendar at creation. Oh, he shows us the pattern. He shows us how he created for six days and he rested on the seventh. But he doesn't give us the Sabbath on the seventh. Or otherwise, it would say in Genesis that you would do this for six days and then seventh day you will rest. Okay? He does that in Exodus 16. And it starts on the 16th day of the month. The first day of work is on the 16th day of the week. Of the month. Excuse me. OK, no true doctrine will lose anything by close examination. And then Troy says the cloud is moving left in the wilderness. I don't know what that means. All right. So. So, you guys, I hope I did not confuse you. I want to take time to to um, take some questions. I see your chat is going very strong there and I have not seen what's going on in the chat. So if you've been asking questions. Now is a uh, time. Now I, now I can see your chat. So let's take a break there. And, and if you have any questions, let's answer them. Everybody understand the function of the moon, that it's not circular, it's elliptical, and that we must reconcile that new moon day as a set-apart day. Rosh Kodesh 
is a set apart day. It's when we are witnessing the moon and we know when to start our first day of the week in work, okay? That's really important to get that down, to understand this. But every month on Yahuwah's calendar, it's going to be the eighth day, the 15th day. The 15th day will always be a full moon, you guys, okay? The 29th day will always be new moon time when there's it's going into a no moon at all. You don't see a moon. It's dark. Okay. Incidentally, this is when Shavuot is. It's at new moon time when there's no moon at all. It's hidden. And I find that fascinating that he hid that, that specific day on the calendar for 2,000 years. He hid it from us. We're, we're doing this thing called Shav, uh, Pentecost, which is 50 days earlier. And if you don't have anything, any understanding of agriculture, you're going to miss it. You're going to, you're going to completely miss what's going on at all. You don't have a, a you don't give a, a rip that there's weed in the field or it's green or it's brown or nothing. If you're celebrating a, a Pentecost, it's just a, a, a day to you and it's just a name to you. But when you put the two together and you understand that there's wheat, this is a wheat harvest and we're waving bread not not sheaves at, at okay so the day after passover we're waving barley a, a cluster of barley the grain we're waving that which is not wheat okay that's the barley harvest wheat has just been planted wheat is planted twice a year it's planted in late winter and early spring which means you have two harvests early summer and late summer but they both are harvested in the summer. Okay, everybody follow me. So don't get that confused with what's going on with the barley. That's done one day after Passover. We're waving a sheath offering to the Father. At Shavuot time, we're waving loaves of bread, which means we've already come through the harvest. We've milled the, the we've threshed the grain, we've milled it into flour, and we've baked it into loaves. Folks, that takes more than 50 days. Again, if you can do it, and I'm not a millionaire, but I'll tell you with great confidence, if you could do that in 50 days, you deserve a million dollars. <laughs> it's not going to happen. You can't do it, you guys. And I challenge you to try it. You can't do it. It takes more than 50 days. It takes more than 100 days, actually. The average harvest time for wheat around the world is 102 to 117 days of growth and the reason for that is wheat has to be cured in the field it has to turn brown in the field and in modern times and in modern ways of of harvesting uh, wheat it's no longer threshed on a threshing floor it's it's pulled away from the chaff in the combine so when it comes when the tractor comes and it combines it it's separated from the chaff. The chaff is blown out the backside of the combine and all that's left is the grain. Now in ancient times, it was done by hand, which was a huge task. Even until the 1800s, it was done by hand. You had a sickle and you, you harvested a handful at a time. And that handful of a time was, was gathered to, you know, to a certain amount, um, not too much more than you could carry, but it was a bunch. A bunch was then bound together and stacked standing straight up because you don't want to lay the ground, the grain on the ground. It will begin to spoil immediately from the moisture from the ground. OK, so it's standing straight up and it's all stacked together in what's called a stall. And then after the harvest is done, the, 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 the wagon would come and they would go, they would gather the stalls and throw them onto the wagon to take to the threshing floor. OK this huge process and it took the whole community to do this this is before tractors and combines keep in mind so interesting thing that you were revealed to me about stacking the grain standing up is the grain can't stand by itself it has to stand with other grain in other words you can't just go and cut some some wheat and stand it by itself it'll fall over it takes its <coughs> brothers and sisters to stand with one another, unity. Does that make any sense? 
Oh, there's yep. a lesson there, you guys. You can't stand on your, on, on your own, and I can't stand on my own. He created us to stand together, just like he created the wheat to stand together in the stalls. And the reason why this is important, he revealed to me in the end times all around the world, if the whole world is, if you can imagine a field of wheat, there are going to be these communities that are going to be standing together in the end times. There's what's called a pre-harvest. And then the final harvest that comes along. So, so in the end, and I think we're in that now, there's a harvest going on. The wheats and the tares being separated. You can see that happening right now. So what's happening to the weeds? They've been taken to the threshing floor? Yeah, but, but before that, we're standing in the field together. And then we go directly to the threshing floor, which is another idiom, agricultural idiom, of what needs to fall away from each one of us. How many know that judgment comes to the house of Elohim first, right? So if we look at that in the parallel, what it is into a wheat field, we're threshed first before we go to the mill to become flour and to be processed into flour and to, and to be made into bread. All of what is not useful, all that can corrupt. In other words, if you leave the chaff with the grain and you just put it in the, in the storehouse, it will spoil, it will cause black mold, moisture will come in, it will destroy the grain. So the chaff has to be removed. That carbon has to be removed and burned and, and separated from the grain. The grain is what is a valuable part. The chaff is not valuable. The chaff represents sin, habits, um, bad relationships, um, bad doctrine. You can see chaff as many different things that need to fall away from you. Who is going to put you on the threshing floor? I'm not the only one that's going to on the threshing floor. But I'm a public figure, then everybody sees what's happening. So the accusations, the, the false, you know, brethren that's that supposedly with me, who removes them from me and leaves only the grain. That happens to every single one of you. You may have seen that in your own life where people have been removed from your life. You've been separated from people that you may have loved. And you see, why is this going on, right? Well, if you examine that pretty closely, you'll probably see that you're two different. One believes one way, no, other believes another way. You are separating you from that, okay? Because you're valuable. And he's going to remove that which is not valuable from you because he don't want you spoiled. The grain cannot be spoiled. It has to be preserved, okay? This is, a, this is an agricultural concept that goes by thousands of years, you guys. And let's not get, you know, confused because we have modern conveniences with tractors and and now we've become modern people where you know where our families are no longer farming so we forget these concepts this is where we get in trouble if we don't if we don't understand this the grain has to be separated from the chaff or the grain will spoil it will be ruined it will be no good and he paid a price for us so you're valuable so the wheat is valuable your soul is valuable. It was paid for with a very hard price. And so he separates us. You don't get a choice in it. I don't get a choice in it. Nobody gets a choice in it. He does it. And he separates us from that which is not valuable, that which corrupts, because you're valuable. Now you're being preserved. Okay. Marty, I, I see you got a hands up. What, what's the question? Yes, thanks. Um, so moon day, new moon day is day one, correct? That's day one, yes. And then when you see the sliver crescent, that's day two? Nope. Okay, so new moon day or day one is when you see that crescent. There are those groups that, that do it kind of what you just said. They'll, they'll, they'll consider the conjunction to be day one. And then when they see the crescent, it'll be day two. I don't agree with that. Day, day one is when you see the crescent. And when you see that crescent, whether it's a Monday or a Tuesday, on the Gregorian, okay, so get this. When you see the crescent, 
no matter what day it is on the Gregorian, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, the rest of the days of the month will be Shabbat. Does that make sense? That makes yeah. it very easy for you guys. So when you see the crescent. Do you count one at the crescent yeah. or do you? No, or the next that's day, day one. At, the, at that night, new moon is over. Now it's, okay. it's day one. You have established day one when you see the crescent. Okay. All right. Because, perfect. Right. Because it could be one day or two days. Now, if you don't see the moon, if you don't see the moon at all, there's no crescent. We're not talking about cloud of obscurity or anything like that. If there's no crescent and there's no clouds in the sky, that means it's two days of a new moon. When you see the crescent at the end of that day, you know, it's day. It's been day one. The next day is day two. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Another question I have is, um, I read that that crescent has to be seen from Israel. Is that no, correct? Yeah, no, no, that is a misconception. And that is that is something that the Christians have, have invented. They do the same thing with Rosh Hashanah. They want to base everything in Israel. You guys, we're in diaspora. We're not in Israel. But these are universal truths. So it is, it is a, that's, a wrong way of reckoning. If if we have to go to what Israel is seeing, we might as well all be in Israel. So what exactly. happens to people that are in Arizona or in Oregon or in Maine, right? We are all right. over the earth, yet we are seeing the same moon and the same sun, okay? So we reckon the calendar the same way no matter where you are, okay? So it doesn't matter where Israel is. Israel, there, there are 24 hours in the day. And so if you go all the way around the, around the earth, you'll notice there are time zones, okay? We're not on the, all on the same time zone. We're not on, on the same zone as Israel. So you have to reconcile the moon and the sun from where you are. And it's still accurate. You're still correct, okay? Even though it may be a day different, like for instance, with the man-made uh, date line, you could be different than, than Australia. You can be one day different than Australia because they're on a different day than we are, which when we were holding class for code searchers, um, that caused a problem because when I would establish a day for class, I would have to make sure that people in Australia and, and a little further, Singapore or anywhere like that, understood. Okay, it's because there's 24 hours that goes all around, all the way around the equator. And it doesn't matter if you're on the flat earth or the globe earth, that's still a universal truth. Okay, so reconcile the moon and the sun from where you are. And you're okay. correct. You're correct from that point. You do not have to do it from Jerusalem. Okay, they didn't have that, that luxury 700 years ago or a thousand years ago. So anybody reconciling the calendar a thousand years ago before the internet, and we could look on the internet and see what Israel was doing. You see what you see what I'm saying? So yeah. can reconcile the calendar from where you are just by signing the moon. Okay. That still establishes a 24 hour day period for the whole earth. Okay. That's a universal truth. We cannot, these are things we cannot change. The father determines this. Okay. We don't. So if you're just going off of what Israel's doing, you're, you're basically just doing what Israel's doing, which is nothing wrong with that. If you want to reconcile the day from, from Jerusalem, you're going to be off. Let's say I was in, in Hawaii and I was doing that. My calendar is going to be off exactly 12 hours. Period. Okay. I got that. I, yeah. I understand that. Yeah. Now, what, what do you do in the event that it's cloudy? And the cloud coverage prevents you from even seeing it. Good question. I use this app, Solarium or whatever. Sol yeah. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. I forgot how to pronounce. But that's what I use. Yeah. That, th this is where we can use technology. If you, if you have clouds, let's say you're in Florida and you're getting rain every day, right? You can't see the, the, the moon. This is where technology comes into play and it can be an advantage. So you would look on, on the app for your area and see whether, whether there's a new moon or, or a crescent at all or not. Um, that is a plus for technology. In other words, if, if it was 700 years ago and we didn't have technology, we would just be what? 
SOL, right? Right. <laughs> SOL. <laughs> we would have Luna. to look for the next day or look for, for whenever we could see the moon. Because the fact is, for every day of the month, the moon is going to look different. There are phases of the moon. Here's the thing I've been saying here recently for a long time. If you have been in a, com a coma for three or four months and suddenly you come out of that coma, how would you reconcile what day of the month it is? The only way you could do that is by looking at the moon. You couldn't do that with the sun. Wake up tomorrow and go look at the sun and see if you can guess what the day it is. You can't. It looks the same every day. But the moon looks different every day. It starts with a crescent. It grows larger from that until it gets full and then it wanes, right? So you have a progression of the moon and then you have a waning of the moon. It's a day for each day of the month of a calendar year. You can look at the moon and determine exactly what day it was just by looking at the moon. And it's going to upset a lot of people. We're like, what? Try it sometime. You could memorize every phase day of the month for the moon and get so good that you could just walk out any month of the calendar and look at the moon and know exactly what day of the month it is. Right. That cannot be done with the sun. The, the sun never changes. It never changes, but the moon does every night. You will notice the moon changing every night. And if you learn every single one of those changes, and by the way, I saw a calendar in Hawaii posted on a tree by the ocean and posted that one one time where there, it's a different day of every day of the month. There's a different moon. In other words, the fishermen knew when were the best times of fishing because of the month, uh, the moon. They can know what 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 the moon was doing, whether it's a full moon or it's a crescent moon. They knew when the best time was for fishing just by observing the moon. They didn't observe the sun. You can't do that as a fisherman and know when's the best time to go fishing just by looking at the sun. You can't do it. Just right. like you cannot determine the day of the month by looking at the sun. But if you look at the moon, you can determine when the best time to go fishing for fishermen. This is a universal truth for fishermen and I have commercial fishermen in my family a lot of fishermen in my family a lot of Native Americans that will do that very thing all Hawaiians understand the the cycle of the moon and they base their fishing on those days so it is the moon that determines the Moedim we have to keep that in mind Mike you got a question brother uh, yes. Uh, hello. It's been a pleasure. It's uh, been a pleasure listening to all your material. I'm pretty new at this. Uh, I'm only two years into my walk. So. <laughs> I'm a newbie compared to most people, such as yourself. But I'm so thankful I got, you're I got here, brother. It does, it does, that, that, is, that is no regard. I'm thankful you are here. Yeah. And you're learning it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, it, it it makes absolute sense to me that that Yah would use the, the sun, moon, and stars. Anything else, it it makes no sense to me. So. Like, and, and plus, I'm a scientist, so it would logically make sense to me that that's the way he uses it. So I got two, yep. two questions. So mm -hmm. is there a definitive, because I watch a lot of your code videos, is there a definitive code on this topic? And number two uh, is the, when does the biblical day start? Because I see interesting cases for either starting in the morning when the first light comes or starting at night. Yeah. yeah. All right. So, so, um, uh, what was that first question? When is the, say that again. No, it, it was the codes. Uh, have you found anything yes. definitive in the codes? Yes. Actually, actually um, someone asked me if we can reconcile the calendar with the codes. And, and so uh, it was proposed to me that the Zadok calendar was proven by the codes. And when I looked at that code that the brother did, um, I was not convinced. It was very loosely uh, come together. But when I, did it myself and I, I actually took a, a I like to triangulate things in other words uh if we're going to pinpoint something using GPS you can't use just one data point you need to use two or three two or three to establish a thing right two or three witnesses to establish it. so the same concept with searching the codes I searched out at least three I ended up with five 
data points. So it's the same thing with geospatial satellites that determine uh, a, a point on that they're looking for. We, with satellites, we went from being able to, to pinpoint something within a square mile to a square yard because the number of satellites. The same thing with codes. If we use more than three to reconcile a, a particular issue, topic, um, then we can get more specific. So I was able to do that with, with the codes. And one of the code um, um, tables that I found came straight from Psalm 104, 19, which is the moon determines the Moedim. I look for that as, as an access term. So it's not only is it in the plain text in Psalm 104, 19, it's also as an access term in Isaiah at a skip of two to four, meaning it's in a very small place in one chapter of Isaiah. So Isaiah is telling us in that code, the moon determines the Moedim. But also I was able to find it in the Hebrew cal the calendar of the Hebrews in um, I apologize, but it's slipping my mind right now. But there's at least three more that I found. I should probably do a video on all of those uh, tables. But I ended up with like four or five tables that pointed all to the same thing. And so, yeah, um, the codes do um, can, you know, point to that or reconcile that. Use I, I call it triangulation. This is when I was in the Marine Corps. That's how we found a, a data point on the map was triangulation. And I could see the same concept in the codes. Um, and what was the second question? Uh, the biblical day. The when biblical. does it begin? Yeah. Yeah. So um, that is going to be at sunrise, brother, for me personally. Mm -hmm. That's how I interpret the scripture. I know some interpret that differently, especially the Jews are going to look at that differently, even with a 24-hour cycle. But the fact is, the Bible describes from sunrise to sunset, which is 12 hours, will be the Shabbat. It's not a 24-hour period. It's from sunrise to sunset. Okay? So that's where I am on that. And I realize there are others mm -hmm. that, that see that differently. I'm not trashing them or downing them. I'm thankful they're keeping a Shabbat at all. Here's the thing. He was going to bring us all. He's going to reconcile us all on the same calendar at some point. And I believe that's going to be in the millennial kingdom. But for us to get the P's and Q's right um, and get us on, on the correct count. And in other words, he's trying to sync. You ever seen a marching band or, or uh, anybody that's marching and they're out of sync? It looks kind of messy, right? That's where the Hebrews are right now. We're not in sync. And so we're kind of looking nasty. When we're marching, everybody's kind of marching to their own tune, right? But once we get into sync, it's going to be like the Marine Corps drill team. You've ever seen, you guys ever seen the Marine Corps drill team? They're all moving at the same time and they're doing all the same movements in synchronous. They're synchronized, in other words. And it's beautiful to watch 70 men doing the same movements at the same time. It's like watching, you know, um, synchronized swimming. It's a beautiful thing when everybody's in time and they're in sync and they're moving. They're doing the same movements at the same time. That is how we're going to be when the Holy Spirit is poured out. We're going to be synchronized. That's what he's revealed to me, you guys. Right now, I see that there are five different ways that the Hebrews are keeping this, this calendar, right? So we're kind of like all out of sync. In other words, like when I was in the Marine Corps and we were just learning how to march, it was ugly. We, every line was different. The, the, the guys next to me was not synced to me, and the guy on the other side of him was not synced to him, and it just looked nasty. But when we got all in sync and we're all doing the same movements, and when the, when the drill instructor said, you know, right oblique or left arm, <laughs> you know, uh, we're all doing the same movements. That's when it's beautiful. That's when there's there's something that's special that happened. Nicole says simplify. Yeah, I don't know if you guys ever seen the Marine Corps drill team, but go Google that and look what I'm talking about. Synchronization. 
when 70 people are doing the same thing at the same time, there's something about that. There's a, there's a, a dance. It's like a dance. Everybody's on the same sheet of music. They're not on different. They're not playing different notes at different times. They're playing the same note at the same time. And there's a harm. Harmony is a perfect word for that. In other words, they're in harmony. Does that make sense? Corey, you got a question. Yes, it's more, well, not really a question. It's more of a suggestion. Mm -hmm. I found that since I've been learning the calendar from you, I fought it in the beginning to actually go out and look at the moon myself. Yeah. And now it's become so much more easier. And I've just, I suggested everyone just get a whiteboard, create that calendar every new moon day, count the weeks, write them out for yourself and take yourself outside look up at the sky, sight the moon. Exactly. That's, it makes it so much easier if you do that. I agree. Like, so much easier. I agree, and that's a good idea, sister. Um, to, uh, let me, there's someone else coming into the room here. You're absolutely right. That is a good idea, and that is a good way to, to reconcile each day of the month is to, to reconcile that day the very, that very first day is important. That new moon day can, can be one day or two days. So we want to get that right. All yeah. right. So um, if you have to write it out and, and if you got to take notes, you guys, I encourage that. This will help you keep track until you get it. It will help if you've got a, a another witness, somebody else that you're doing it with, because you can you can both kind of bounce the ideas off of each other. Right. And it's not just left to one person. This is biblical. There's always two witnesses in, in the in Hebrew communities that would go and cite them, not just the seventh month like the Jews do. The Jews do it every year on the seventh month. Two witnesses go and establishes Rosh, uh, uh, Rosh Hashanah. You guys, that's that's supposed to happen every month, not just the seventh month. The Jews only only do it on the seventh month. But according to the Bible, the Hebrews are supposed to reconcile the, the month every month the same way two witnesses and a shofar and once we see that that new moon that crescent we blow the shofar and we establish it is now new moon time the whole community now knows it's new moon time and so if you got to write it out do that you guys and that'll help you learn each week each each month each day of what it is so again the eighth the 15th, the 22nd, and the 29th of the month is always the Shabbat according to the Bible. And I, guys, once again, I can prove this with one chapter of the Torah in Exodus 16, and Yahuwah establishes this for 40 years. That's, that's how long they were in the desert, going around in circles, collecting manna, <laughs> and doing the same thing over and over again. Six days they collected manna. The, uh, for, on the sixth day, it was twice as much. On the seventh day, they rested. That was the 15th, the, the, the 8th, the 15th, the 22nd, and the 29th every month, you guys. Didn't have to go outside the Torah to see that. Didn't have to use Jubilees one time to see that. Now we're taking Jubilees out of context if we use Jubilees only to reconcile the calendar, we can get way messed up. If you only use Jubilees, you're going to be wrong, period. We cannot use a book outside the Torah to establish doctrine. That's bad hermeneutics to do that. And I hear, I see people doing that all the time. And it's a very compelling thing. And they like to take the, some of those verses and twist them around and make you confused and make you think like, well, if, if we're keeping the lunar solar, we're going to have 10 days extra. Well, that's true if you don't reconcile the new moon. That's the whole key to that. If you don't observe the new moon, which can be one or two days, you will end up with a, with a, a, a cumul accumulation of days every year, roughly around 10 days. Some years it can be nine days. Some years it can be 11 days. But the writer in this expresses that truth 
to be 10 days, which is absolutely true. If you do not reconcile the new moon days correctly, you will end up with 10 extra days, at least 10 extra days every year. That's the secret of that. So that's the thing about Jubilees. We can glean from it, but it is bad hermeneutics to establish doctrine from it. And the reason is because you've got two authors that are opposing each other in that one book. Okay, so so it contradicts itself. And so we got to be able to to reconcile that and what is going on with those those two authors to understand the calendar. Everybody with me. Good. I'm so glad that you, you guys are interested uh, in this calendar and that you've uh, shown up for this class. What we got. Um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 people here. You guys, it, it blesses my heart to see this number of people interested in learning the calendar um, in, in just short, a short notice. And here's the thing. I know that when I started uh, keeping his Shabbat this way, and I was doing the Jewish thing Saturday, Every Saturday, I was keeping the Shabbat, and it was it was a blessing to me. It was a great place to learn. I am not downing those people. At least they're trying to keep the Shabbat. But let me tell you something. If you want to see some, your life change and blessings come into your life, start keeping that according to the moon and watch what happens. Blessings will follow you everywhere you go. I'm not even kidding. And, and don't think that just because you're working for Joe Schmo and you're, you're working for the man or whatever, that you can't do it. You can. My students that were with me in the code class and that were trying to do the, and, and they said the same thing. Oh, I don't know if we can do it. My boss is never going to let me do this. Try it. Go to your boss and say, here, listen, I'm trying to keep a Shabbat according to the moon. And every month it's going to be different, right? And you propose to him. You know, it, uh, you, you, of course, you can't tell them a, a day ahead of time. Give them, a, you know, a, a, a schedule. You can determine that from day one of, of the new moon day. You're going to know all month when your Shabbat is. So let's say it's Monday. And you go to your boss on, you know, the, the month before. And you, you come through new moon and you say, OK, boss man, my Shabbat is going to be on Mondays, all Mondays this week of this month. You can negotiate Shabbats. Don't sell yourself short and say it's impossible. It is, it's not impossible. I've seen people do it. Now, there may be boss that say absolutely not. I'm not saying that's not going to happen. But you, if you at least try and you take that step and you pray and say, Father, please allow this, allow me to walk out your, your Shabbats according to the moon. He'll make a way, you guys. I've seen him do it over and over again because someone here recently told me, oh, that's you can't do that unless you're your own. You're your own boss. That's not true. There's some people out there that understand and that, that have compassion on those uh, that want to keep a Shabbat. You just propose it to them and see what happens. You who will make a way if you're if you are taking a step toward his Shabbat, he will open the door and make a way. OK, so don't don't sell that thing short. OK, there's it is possible. But here's the thing. When you are walking it out and you do get on it, watch what happens in your life. Things become easier. He starts blessing you in ways that you don't expect. And blessings start to follow you. He starts protecting you and and keeping. Uh, wow, there's still people trying to get in. Still got people trying to come in a little bit late. That's OK, though. Good thing I recorded this. So he'll make a way and he'll start showing you that there's something special about that walk and it takes walking it out. And if you can do it with, with someone else and it's not just yourself, it's a little more easier because you can kind of bounce thing off, you know, bounce things off of each other, questions, scriptures and those kinds of things. And um you know, it's a little easier than trying to figure it out yourself. Here's a good thing about doing this class. Now we have a, 
a group that we can hold each other accountable and we can ask each other questions and kind of, you, you'll know, you'll be able to message Carrie or Nicole or Joanna or whatever and say, hey, it's tomorrow. Did you see the moon? Yeah, I saw the moon. So we'll know, you know what I'm saying? So, so having a community is a big thing um, to, to help you out. So again, if, you, if you're working and, and you have a boss that's kind of, you know, Saturday, Friday is the, the, the end of the week and Saturday and Sunday and all that, propose to them that you are on a lunar solar calendar and your Shabbat changes every month. See what happens. Don't give up on that. And when, he, and when they allow it, watch what Yahuwah will do to that. He will meet you there. And this will put you on an exact calendar so that when your Passover comes around and your Shabbat comes around, you're on the exact day. And the reason for this is to be important is because the Bible says he opens up a doorways of heaven and pours out his blessings on those days. This is why the enemy wants to obscure it. And he'll use translators and theologians and everybody else to hide that day because he don't want you to know those days. He don't want you to know to the, the, the correct Shabbat. He would rather you be on a pagan Shabbat doing Sundays, right? You would don't honor that, especially now in the time of technology and when, when his truth has gone out, just like his name. Let me just say this. I got saved under the name Jesus and called him God all my life. And he met me there. But when I came into truth and I learned about his name and that he is not called God, he has a name, things changed. Now we're held accountable for truth. You understand? Leviticus 17. This is why Yeshua said, Father, forgive them for they know what, not what they do. When they was nailing him to the cross, our Messiah was pleading law to the Father to not hold them accountable what they were doing to him because they didn't know what they were doing. In other words, the, the congregation is not held accountable for what is done in ignorance. But once you know the truth, the game changes. Everybody understand that? Everybody here knows his name. Anybody here walking in truth and calling him Jesus and calling him God you're held accountable for that because you now know the truth. There's power in his name. The scripture specifically says where two or more gathered in my name, there I am also, right? Don't you know that the enemy knows this? And somewhere in the playbook of the enemy, it says, what? We got to change that name because there's power in his name. So what do they do 500 years ago? They changed the name Yeshua into Jesus. This is, this is a big deal. This is a really big deal, you guys, because there's power in his name. And to take power from us would be to what? To lie to us. Bait and switch. Give us something else. Right? I'm not coming against the name Jesus, you guys. And there, there have been some Christians that have been offended that I've said that. This is true. And it's sometimes a hard truth to hear. You guys, but that is the truth. We have an enemy that is, he's determined to come against us in every way, in every form. And there's no rule book when it comes to, to the enemy. Low blows, kicking you in, in the unmentionables, all those things that are forbidden in boxing. There's no rules when it comes to the enemy. So if there's power in the name, He's going he's gonna to do something to obscure that, to hide that, to change that, so you don't have access to it. But when you know the truth and you're walking in it, there's power in that. You guys, when I was in Hawaii and the lava was happening and my brother uh, Jason lived in a community of, of mostly pagans, and this is a Hebrew brother, knows the name of the father and the name of the son, and the lava is coming down from, from uh, Leilani to his farm. I personally walked around that whole community. It's 100 acres, and I saw gate after gate of each one of these pagans that were in his community 
that had all these flower offerings and, and a, a very common offering for Hawaiians is to put a bottle of gin and some flowers and some fruit at the gate of your property to, to ask Pele to not destroy your property. I took video and pictures of this and I pointed out my brother Jason. I was like, bro, look at what these people are doing. They're putting out gin, a bottle of alcohol and some flowers to this God called Pele to please don't destroy our properties, right? Guess what? It destroyed every single one of them, put them 60 feet under solid rock. Every single one of them that did that. Me and Jason walked around his property claiming who was named and asking him to please stop this lava. And as I'm sitting here, if I'm lying, I'm dying. Strike me dead, Father. I witnessed him stop this lava right before his farm. Stopped it. The only finger, okay, so there were five fingers that came down from it. They kind of branched off sort of like rivers. Five fingers, only one of them like this stopped. The rest of them, so his, his property got surrounded by lava and the lava continued all the way to the ocean because gravity, I mean, we're talking about downhill from the top of the mountain. Gravity dictates that the lava is going to the ocean. You cannot stop it. You can spray water on it. You can pull bulldozers and do all that kind of stuff. It don't stop. <laughs> Only the name of the father stop. And, and when it stopped, you guys, I'm looking at 40 feet. I took pictures of it. 40 feet of lava is just all these little rocks and stuff. When we're talking about uh, uh, lava, uh, it's not liquefied. It's other words, it's like it's, cl it's clinking like glass. Little little rocks, big rocks, small rocks, big rocks, they're all kind of rolling very slowly um, when it's flowing. It stopped and it cooled and it didn't go any further. But every property that was calling on a false name is no longer there. But my brother Jason is still there. There's power in the name. Now, some will say, oh, that's just a fluke. That's just a fluke. That's just, you know, no. I don't believe that. I don't believe it. I've I've witnessed I've witnessed lava going uphill. It is it is the craziest thing you've ever seen. It, the forces behind that is 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 amazing. It's it's powerful. It's it's like trying to stop a, a runaway train. You're not going to just get in front of it and just stop it. It doesn't happen like that. But calling on its name and seeing that it stops within a day before it even got to your farm and everybody else around you that are calling on Pele is completely wiped out is exactly what my Yuhua does. You see that pattern in the Bible. That's how David destroyed Goliath. David walks out onto the, to the, uh, the battleground. And what does he say? He says, I come into you, come to you with the name of the father. You come at me with mocking and with javelins and spears i come with come at you with the name of the father and what happened this little boy shepherd boy destroyed the champion of the philistines and it was all because of the name that's the key in that story he came in the name the name, the name of the father so then there's power in his name his real name we're not talking about fake names and yes there's faith you can move mountains if you if you're in a place where you believe Jesus is a name you don't know his real name absolutely your faith is a big magnifier in this but when you're walking in truth now try to do that when 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 you know the truth and call on Jesus and see, and see what happens who had told me the reason why he exposed so many false prophets in this last election is because of what they were calling on Jesus and God and he said, my name has been established. Malachi is being fulfilled. I will no longer respond. He told me I won't lift one finger to stop the steal from Biden. Why? Because he was exposing every single one of the false prophets 
all at one time. All at one time, you guys. More than 400 all around the world saying, God told me this. God told me that. Jesus said, Donald Trump's going to save this nation. He's going to be president again. And to my notion, I couldn't find anybody else on Facebook, uh, YouTube saying what I was saying. And trust me, it was very difficult for me to jump out there and, and to say what I did. The, the days leading up to the election, Donald Trump is not going to be president. It's going to be Biden, and he's going to steal it. And you have said he's not going to lift one finger to stop it. That was why. He was establishing the power in his name. He is no longer responding to God. You hear what I'm saying? There's power in his name. There's a reason why the enemy wanted to hide it from us. It's a powerful name. And his, and his son's name is powerful. So don't you know the enemy wants to steal that from you and hide it and get you to call on another name? That works when you don't know the truth because of uh, Leviticus 17. But when you know the truth, it's a whole different story. I seen a, uh, a guy who's, who's on YouTube. I'm not going to call his name. This stood out to me because he, he made a video where he went out into, he, he's a, he says this in every one of his videos. I'm so-and-so a pastor from Northern California, right? Well, he went into a, a forest in Northern California, and he said that he said this prayer that he prayed to Jesus and asked, why don't you hear me anymore? Why don't you hear me anymore? When he, when he did that video and I saw him, I was like, brother, it's because his name has been established in the whole world now. You know his name is not Jesus. It's Yahushua. If we want to be technical, Joshua in the English. There's no Jesus. That's a false name. That's an enemy's, the, the name the enemy gave us to try to take away the power. But because of his grace, the Father met us where we were because we were ignorant. Everybody understand? So these things are very important that we get, listen, attention to detail is, is critical when it comes to the Father. There, there's a such thing as grace. But when he starts revealing his truth and we're walking in it or we're not walking in it, 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 it draws a line in the sand, so to speak. It makes or breaks your faith. Everybody with me? Courtney, if you want to be really technical, like I said, it's, it's Yahushua, right? I like to say Yeshua because of what it means, what that name means. And it's, it's a great transition for Christians into the Hebrew walk. Because when you start going into Yahushua, it's like, what, what? Technically, that is his name, which means Joshua in English. Let's just take the word Isus in the, in the Greek. That's what they say Jesus comes from. But if you look at Isus in the Old Testament, meaning Joshua and Caleb, we got the word, the name Joshua. Where does this Jesus come from? Because it's the same word in Greek. I ask that to pastors all the time, and it's like, I don't have an answer for that. Well, yeah, that's a problem. Because there's something up with this name Jesus. It doesn't fit. And it makes sense to me. After, after you know, reading all of what is going on, where two or more are gathered in my name, I'll be there also, right? And, and there's power in the name. It makes sense to me because we've got a cunning enemy. He don't want you to have access to power. He wants you to be deceived. But when truth comes, we're held accountable, you guys. That's where the difference, that's where it becomes a line drawn in the sand. It's no longer, you know, okay to say, you know, Jesus when you know the truth. It's no longer to say God when you know the truth. Does that make sense? Incidentally, why would you want to do that when in, in Malachi, a prophecy of, in the end times, when who it says in the third chapter that there are those, <clears throat> incidentally, because we're talking about his name right now in this group, each one of your names is written in something called the book of remembrance. Go read Malachi and see what I'm telling you is true. It's so important to the father that when he sees us speaking about his name, 
he says to an angel, hey, take note of this. They're speaking about my name. Write them down in a book of remembrance because these ones who fear me and fear my name will be jewels in my diadem. If you don't know what a diadem is, it's a crown. He's declaring that those who talk about his name, who fear his name, will be the jewels in his crown. I don't know about you, but I want to be there. There's no better place to be in the kingdom than a jewel in the crown of the father you guys agreed that is the best place to be right and why is that because we're talking about his name yes it's that important the fact that we're talking about his name he he designates a book called remembrance and tells an angel to write down the names of each one of those because they're going to be jewels in his crown don't let nobody steal that from you and call you a sacred namer. That should be a badge of honor, by the way. It's not a derogatory term. It's a badge of honor. And I wear it proudly. Yeah, call me a sacred namer. Try calling me that on the day of judgment. You'll see where I'm, I'm at. I'm in his crown. Okay. It's a very special place because his name is powerful. It's very special to him. It's more than 430 scriptures that have something to do with his name call upon his name you know praise his name exalt his name all of these things about his name there's more than 400 scriptures about his name why are not pastors teaching in the name today it's because they're ignorant ignorance is deadly okay care Corey, you got a question yeah it's something that courtney and i have <laughs> gone back and forth and discuss a lot about the way that I have come to understand the names as they are written out. What I what was put in my mind and what was called to remembrance for me was that each time Yah says those that call on my name, the I mean the words that come out of our mouth or the sound that comes yeah. out of our mouth. And I think that a lot of people are hung up on the spelling and just that whole thing. But I'm thinking about the way different cultures may pronounce certain ways and certain words and the way that we pronounce things in English. The most important thing for me is that it's the H, U is a breath. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, yeah, I've heard people say, Yahweh and to me that still sounds like Yahuwah mm -hmm. because I know that H is a breath so it's Yahuwah mm -hmm. you're still saying the who but it's not as a Yahuwah it's stressed like Yahuwah and the same with the Shua I get like the same mm -hmm. like that's a breath and I feel like we're all headed that way when we use their names and just important to know that it is not Jesus, God, all of these other pagan right. names. And I just feel that, I think that we, if we think less about the division and separating of the name to just speak his name. Absolutely. However, it is in your dialect, dialect uh, accent, speak his Absolutely. name. Absolutely. And this is, this is what's important about understanding those four letters can be pronounced a number of ways. Yes. It, it can be Yahuwah, Yahweh, Yahu, uh, Yahweh. Um, the, the only one for sure it's not is Jehovah. There is yes. no J. Okay, so Jehovah, if you hear the Jehovah Witnesses, yada, 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 you know, they, they are trying, but the problem, the problem is there's no J. The J only existed 500 years ago. So we know this cannot be what you know they were saying in ancient times so it must be the other ones now if you're using the other ones yahweh or i personally believe they're all correct because the father's name is so dynamic that they're all correct there's no wrong way of saying those four letters in other words unless you're using the jehovah if you're pronouncing those in the phonetic ways that they can be pronounced in in hebrew they're all correct so this is, you know, I, I differ with what um, 
Nehemiah Gordon says. Nehemiah Gordon says it's 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 Yehovah, which is is very correct. But if you take into consideration that the Yiddish did not precede the Paleo Hebrew, and there was no Yiddish sounds, in other words, the 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 sounds used to pr pronounce Yehovah, um, they didn't exist in the time of the Paleo. Okay, Wa and Va. Um, they're they're different, okay. So, it technically in the Paleo Hebrew, and this is this is my understanding of it, would be Yahuwah in the Paleo Hebrew. The Yahovah va 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 came much later than wa. Does that make sense? This is the Yiddish. This came from Ashkenazi and Sephardic Judaism. So. This is why I differ then, because many people message me about Nehemiah Gordon, and I agree with the brother. He's absolutely correct. He's pronouncing it in the way that he understands, which is from the Yiddish. Does that make sense, you guys? You understand what I'm saying? Which would be the Eastern European way of Yiddish would mean like like the Jews of Eastern Europe. Okay, so v, the V sound did not predate the W sound. The W the wa and the va is the same letter. It's the same letter. Which one came first? It was the wa. Okay, so it's Yahuwah, not Yahu Yehovah. Does that, does that make any sense? But they're both, in, in my opinion, they're both correct because you can pronounce those four letters a, a handful of ways. The only way that it's not possible is Jehovah because there's no... There was no J until about 500 years ago, and it came from, it came from, you guys know where it come from? It come from the Jesuits of the Catholic Church. That's where it came from. More specifically, the Jesuits of Sweden. That's where the letter J came from. And this is, this is why I disagree with that pronunciation. I don't down those people um, because they're very close, and, and you will, listen. I can't put him in a box if he can meet people anywhere. And so if he's going to meet people there and they're calling him Jehovah and they're calling his son Jesus, he will meet you there. But when you know the truth, guess what? He's going to he's going to teach you that. He's going to not answer you and you're going to be like, "Why are you not answering me?" He's going to tell you why. Right? So, uh, that's that's my opinion on it. So, good point, sister. All right, we've got any, any more questions on the calendar? This is our class for the very first calendar. We're, we're going to probably do this every Monday, you guys, until you guys have it, okay? So um, I'm making that commitment to you. Um, every Monday at 7 o'clock, it'll be the same link. We'll meet here in Zoom for um, more calendar insight. So, um yeah, there's not any more questions. We're gonna I'm gonna close out for with prayer here and we'll see you next Monday. All right. Any more questions? All right. Let me pray and then we will see you next Monday. Abuhua, I'm so thankful, Father, for each and one of these of your people who are hungry for your word, for your name, and for your calendar. Father, I ask that you go with each one of them that you would encourage them, that you would bring revelation from your word, that you would reveal these things to, to them so that they can see it clearly. Father, they're hungry and they're thirsty for their truth. And I pray that you would just meet them there, Abba, that you would reveal this truth to them and that you would show them the power that comes in walking in the name and walking in your Shabbat and keeping the feast according to what your word says, Father. In spite of what we've experienced before and where you've met us before, now is a new day. We're walking out your calendar together, Abba, and we're asking you, uh, you would to meet us there. Father, go with them this week. Teach them in your word. Keep them covered with your angels and bring them back at the appointed time. I ask this in Yeshua's name. Amen. All right, you guys. I love you. And I'm thankful for you um, showing up and uh, participating. We'll see you next Monday, Eastern time at 7 p.m. Uh, for another class. So shalom to you, and we'll see you then.